So, um, today I'm scheduled to give a, a, an update talk on JIT Builder 2, um, which I've been kind of shortening from JIT Builder 2.0 to JB2, <laughs> uh, just to uh, make it a little bit easier to say. Uh, and I wanted to start off with an apology because uh, this is actually the fourth meeting that this update has been scheduled to be presented at, and I've had to cancel the first three of these due to unforeseen circumstances, different ones in each case, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I want to apologize for all the scheduling snafus associated with this talk, uh, and hopefully uh, people still enjoy it. <laughs> all right, so in terms of an outline, I mean, this is, this is really just an incremental update, so there's nothing really earth-shattering that's happening here. The, the bulk of what I wanted to talk about today on the meeting was around OMR and CMake integration, so the fourth topic there. But there are a few other things that I wanted to give some updates on and just kind of uh, directional sort of uh, things that might be happening with, with JB2 as, as, uh, as I go forward here. Um, and just things that I've been developing so you know what's there. Um, so the first one on this list is um, that I, in JB2 I have been using kind of STL containers to, for lists and vectors and, and, and so on in various um, aspects of the IL data structures. Um, I might be moving away from that now. I've made one first step in that direction because it made a lot of sense for me. Um, it, uh, hopefully most people have at least a basic idea in their heads of JB2. I didn't have to give a refresher on it. Maybe I should have. But nonetheless, uh, one of the fundamental parts of the JBIL is an operation, which is kind of what you'd think it would be just from the name. Um, these operations used to be uh, listed in a in an STL uh, list inside uh, a build inside a the build a builder object the builder object that contained the operations uh, as a list, and so in you know given that it was a an STL container you know you could you could ask for an iterator on it you could iterate through them, um, but it made sort of, it made for sort of an awkward um, uh, API for trying to walk through the the entire uh, graph of a, like a control flow graph because you're flipping from builders to operations all the time and and the operation in order to walk through a builder you needed an iterator and if you ever had to walk away from like if you had an operation that jumps away to someplace else in order to continue iterating you kind of have to remember where your your iterator was in the builder that you came from so that when you came back you could restart in the right place and 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 so you, you're always kind of flipping back between which builder am i in and what is its iterator and, and and where am i iterating in it so i i decided in the end that it would be much easier <laughs> if operation just became uh sort of embedded an embedded doubly linked list and uh, that makes things a lot actually a lot easier actually because that you can basically a program point can now be represented as a pointer to an operation and from that from that pointer you can kind of walk up or down or forwards or backwards in the control flow graph very easily you can remember where you came from with by just storing a pointer to an operation and that operation can be used to continue an iteration in either direction um, inside uh, inside the builder object that it comes from and and since an operation has a parent pointer to the builder that contains it you can always kind of go up um, or or, uh, or or go to the other builder operation uh, builders that might be referenced by an operation so anyway it's it's kind of made things a lot uh, easier for uh, walking around inside um, or uh, around the, the the IL constructs here uh, um, and I confess I didn't really find very much use from the iterators themselves other than the fact that you could just kind of ask for one and, and iterate through it. Uh, but I did find that the, op the iterator data structure kept permeating all over the place and, and, uh, and, and trying to remember it all the time was, was kind of a pain in the butt. So anyway, so this, this simplified things. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, it, it, on the one sense you'd say, well, the list is kind of um, polluting <laughs> The, the, the purity of the operation. Um, but actually I think this notion that operation star is a, like a, a pointer to an operation is a program point actually makes the fact that it's, it's, it's in this doubly linked list and also has a parent pointer to its builder. I think that actually is uh, in essence a, a fairly fundamental aspect of the operation, right? It makes it into a program point. And I think that's a very valuable kind of abstraction um, for 
for it. So I, I think I'm going to keep this. Um, I also have to say that I'm, I haven't generally been a big fan of what the STL allocators um, have required in OMR as general. I mean, I know there's, I know there's there's some advantages to being able to use STL containers and the iterators and so on as part of uh, the OMR compiler, but the complexity that it brings into the allocator story and into the memory management story is 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 not something I've been terribly excited about. Um, I mean, it is just a complex story by itself, but the allocator piece makes it even that much more complicated. Um, uh, and, and this is an area where JB2 needs to get better, this memory management um, aspect. So I'm, I'm not looking forward to having to reproduce a lot of the, the, uh, the stuff that was built as part of the OMR compiler in order to support um, you know, STL containers. So this, this might be um, a step towards um, you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, not using STL at, at all in, in JB2, but I haven't quite pulled the trigger on that, but it, it is a direction that I'm thinking about at this point. Um, one of the biggest new things that I've added since the last time I talked is that I've brought in more of the original API from JIT Builder 1 uh, that was used for virtual machine state manipulation. So I've defined a VM extension uh, which is called VM <laughs> uh, and VM extension, which adds the bytecode builders and the virtual machine state and uh, three of the virtual machine state implementations, register, register instruct, and operand stack. I didn't do operand array yet, but it, it should be a fairly, since it was a fairly straightforward modification to operand stack, it should be a fairly straightforward modification to bring it into this uh, scheme as well. I took the two code samples that already existed in JIT Builder 1 for, for VM registers and operand stack and turned them into tests that are uh, in the VM slash test directory now. Uh, and those kind of get automatically added to the tests that are run for JIT Builder 2 if, if, uh, if it's ever built. Um, it's an extension like any other one, so it can be loaded optionally um, by a compiler. So if a compiler needs these VM extensions, it can load them. If it doesn't need them, it doesn't have to load them. Uh, the load, the, load um, uh, the, the statement that you need in order to load it, I've shown there as an example, is compiler.load extension and, you, and, and using the, the VM extension type to automatically cast for you. Um, I guess uh, all, all of so this is a bit of a different extension than I've than the base extension, which base extension defines all of the sort of primitive types and a lot of the the simple operations that we had in JIT Builder One. So that's it's primarily a bunch of operations and types. Uh, VM extension doesn't actually create any operations or types. It it's used to it it provides you can think of them as services, and those services allow you to. Uh, create operations or simplify the creation of operations uh, using using the base uh, extension. So the VM extension depends on the base extension basically. Um, uh, I did introduce a new eh, all right so this this may be a controversial thing here. Uh, so uh, if you remember from my earlier presentations JB2 is not a static single assignment IL. Uh, it could be used to implement an SSA IL, but it is currently not an SSA IL. Like it's not enforced. It's not. It doesn't require you to, to do things. However, uh, values are kind of implicitly SSA in that you, you define it once and then you can and then you um, you can use it, but you can't. Uh, you're not supposed to override it. However, um, as part of the virtual machine state support. Uh, in JIT Builder 1, there was this uh, little service that nobody was supposed to use except for the virtual machine state implementation, which would copy over the, uh, a, a value from one, uh, from one value on top of another one, basically, so that you could reuse the, all of the information about where that value was stored. It could be reused by uh, JIT Builder 1. Now, it was a little bit more important in JIT Builder 1 because um, it's a... JIT Builder 1 is a, is a pass-through API, so it's, it's actually generating OMR compiler IL as you make calls. And you don't know um, at the point of uh, a use of a value, you don't know that you've generated the code for all of the definitions that would need to reach that use. So um, JIT Builder 1 kind of had to 
had to be able to do this thing because the the most normal way that you would you would um, you would be translating code you'd you'd define some uh, like you'd push something onto an operand stack on one path and then you'd flow down and you and uh, and some use later on would pop it off the operand stack and use it but then you you might be translating some other control flow path which pushes a different value onto that that uh, position in the operand stack and then creates a control flow edge that that joins in the in, in the middle of the previous def and use so in that sense you've already generated the code for the first def and the first use so you really have to be able to <laughs> um, modify you know the values that are coming in on this new flow path that just got created uh, so that it can it can flow into the code that you've already um, of the use that you've already built now that problem doesn't exist in JIT Builder 2 per se because you, uh, in JIT Builder 2 you generate all the IL and then all the IL gets translated later on but for now it, it operates a lot like JIT Builder 1 does so to, to kind of um, uh, I'll loosely use the word formalize but I don't think this is a very formalized thing yet. Uh, I, I, I created a pseudo operation called merge def which allows you to do this kind of the same kind of uh, merging thing. And the idea is essentially that it, it lets you create a, a def use web like here are all the definitions that use this web or you can it, it's almost like a value number. It's a way of um, uh, instantiating a, a value number if you like right where different no, value number is not quite the right word either, but um, where all these definitions can reach this use and you need them to be able to, at the use point, you need to use, you can only reference a single thing. So it's how do you get that thing uh, and, and, and have all of the different definitions come together. Um, the idea here is, is that it's not like uh, freewheeling, you can, you know, <laughs> go and combine uh, uh, definitions all over the place and, and generate all kinds of crazy things the idea would be to limit this so that it's sort of uh, similar in nature to what you would do with SSA in a way um, so the the idea is that if you if the use is for a value for value one and it has multiple definitions that all of the um, all of the uses of v1 have to be reachable from that merge def so it's kind of limiting how you can use merge def a little bit um, it, uh, and I, I want to be very clear on that last sub bullet there it's not something that I've definitely decided is the right way to do this but I wanted to play with it a bit because it's a slightly different way of looking at the problems that SSA were is, is designed to solve and I'm curious whether or not it makes things easier or makes things um, harder <laughs> Um, but I haven't been able to get things advanced enough to the point where, you know, if, if once I get start, start doing things like data flow analysis, it would be interesting to see how this works and, 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 and seeing how it works with transformations on code, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. So it's, it's there, it's in the code base. It does support this virtual machine, um, stack stuff, but, uh, but it's, it's not something that's kind of, um, absolutely going to be there forever. Uh, what else to say here? Yeah, that last comment is just basically it's it's kind of replicating a bunch of support that was in JB one that was very useful for building different compilers. So it's kind of important infrastructure for people who are who have used JB one in the past. Most people who were right using JB one in the past were taking advantage of bytecode builder and these virtual machine state um, functions. So they're now available in JB two for use. Uh, along the same lines, I started uh, um, making an explicit complex extension because complex was one of the examples that um, I always used with JIT Builder 1 as a sort of thing that you could introduce into JIT Builder as a, as a new type. Um, but it was always hard to do in JIT Builder 1. It required a lot of effort to create new types and to, to be able to, to, to manipulate and reference them. And it was kind of ugly. It's something that I've used as a as an example in JIT Builder 2 as I've been developing it. And here I just wanted to kind of bring it into the whole 
uh, management of extensions. So just to see how that plays out and, and how it works. Uh, and it's also the thing that, for, that starts driving this, this uh, type replacer facility that I've, I've talked about before, uh, which is meant to be uh, a mostly automatic <laughs> uh, mechanism for being able to lower uh, user-defined types into uh, sort of types that are well known within the the uh, the extensions that know how to generate uh, code directly. Uh, so in, in this case, the the idea is that you've you've got this thing called a complex type, but you don't have direct code generation support for it. So you need something to take the complex um, so that all of these uses of complex types and all of the operations that operate on complex types and translate them into lower level kind of IL that that you know how to generate code for, right? As a sort of proof point for being able to do more complicated and, and wicked things where you may not, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not hard to imagine writing direct code generation support for something like a complex type, but if your type got really, really complicated, then you might not want to, you know, generate code directly for it maybe. So in, in this, it, it's sort of a, you know, testing out this, this mechanism and it drives the requirement for type replacer. So type replacer is, is, a, is a, um, a facility that I talked about in one of my previous talks on this where it, it um, uh, again, it's sort of a semi-automatic mechanism for replacing user-defined types, it brings the notion that a, a user-defined type should have a layout defined as associated with it, which is kind of like a physical, it's a struct, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be a struct, um, but it, it usually is a struct, which sort of uh, provides the physical layout for the various bits in, in your user-defined type. So in the case of complex, it's a struct that has a real and an imaginary part and, and has whatever float um, whatever size float it is that you want in this particular case. I've generalized it a bit from how I've used complex in the past. And then um, and, and then the type replacer kind of knows that whenever you're working on a value that's that has the type complex or complex float 32 say, that that's actually two float 32s, one that's associated with the real part and one that's associated with the imaginary part. And it can sort of automatically help you translate code that references you know, a complex value, it will automatically help you um, carry around the two constituent bits. And then uh, if your operations are very, very straightforwardly map onto the, the different bits, then it will automatically translate them. So for example, an add, you know, it, an add just adds the corresponding real bits and the corresponding imaginary bits together. And, uh, and that gives you your result that that can be done automatically by uh, by type replacer but something like um, um, uh, multiply <laughs> or the more complicated like magnitude or conjugate those ones are more complicated and they require you to write code that that basically um, you know it will it will apply that code as it's doing this type replacement thing to to inject specific sequences that deal with the various real and imaginary parts and it provides mechanisms for you to to um, talk about those those uh, intermediate bits while you're while you're generating the code, so it just provides a model for you to do this kind of thing, um, and it's starting to uh, give me ideas for a generic sort of model for how an extension can reliably uh, make changes to existing analyses, transformations, and so on, uh, so that you can in essentially inject support for um, your operations or your types or your uh, needs in terms of these analyses into the other extensions so that one extension can define an analysis but there's a sort of generic mechanism for being able to extend it and add support for other things into it so that when that pass runs if it encounters operations or types from another extension it, there's, there's a way for you to kind of help it understand how to deal with that. Uh, so I, I'm not going to talk about that anymore because it's a it's it's not quite well formed in my head yet what that's going to look like, but it's it's starting to um, give me ideas in that space, uh, and that's also coming up in. Um, I've also been most recently actually I'm not going to talk about that. I, I didn't get time to add that to the talk, but most recently I've been 
working on bringing forward the debugger so that it can uh, work with the concept of extensions and compilers and because it was written before all of those changes got made. And so this, the same sets of issues are arising in, in the how I'm translating the debugger and that um, you know, it's, it's, it's further helping to kind of form those ideas on how, how, how that can be done um, you know, sort of easily <laughs> in quotes. Uh, right, okay, so and so this, yeah, so this is really just the same complex kind of types that I've talked about in the past. You know, the, the main addition here is that I've sort of templatized a complex type so that it can have uh, sort of a, a different base type. And it's going to define both complex float 32 and complex float 64. As a, you know, I, I only ever talked about complex double before in my previous samples, so now it's a little bit more general. And I've taken the samples that the sample that works on matrix multiply, generalized it for these different uh, complex types, and added them as tests uh, as well. And that's all there. All right. And so I think the last big topic here is. Um, integration with OMR. So I've been thinking about a little bit how, how, <laughs> if Chip Builder 2 is going to be folded into OMR, what would be the easiest and least painful way to do that? And so one of the, one of the um, efforts that I went through between, since the last time that I talked here was to basically fold Chip Builder 2 into OMR and into the, the CMake builds. And so what I've described here is kind of a way that I did it, which made it work. Like it works now <laughs> quite well, I would say. Um, so I, I, I basically started, I didn't modify the existing JIT builder code. Um, what I did was I copied it to uh, JIT builder 2. So there's now JIT builder and there's now JB2 in my sort of local version of OMR, uh, which allows the, the, the code that supports JIT Builder to evolve separately for JIT Builder 2 than for JIT Builder, a little bit anyway. I did, it didn't actually help as much as I had thought it was going to when I started, but because <laughs> um, most of the actual underlying support for JIT Builder is actually in the OMR compiler in the form of the, uh, the files that are in the ILGen directory. So it doesn't actually split those out at all. But nonetheless, um, there are there are a couple of things that you can do differently in JIT Builder 2 uh, when you do this, and it, it sort of decouples JIT Builder 2 evolution from JIT Builder evolution, which seemed like a not awful story given that we have a number of compilers that were built on top of JIT Builder 1, and the API does change between JIT Builder 1 and JIT Builder 2. Um, once I copied everything to JB2, I removed anything that wasn't specifically needed. So LLJB, for example, I, I removed that directory you know, from JIT Builder to, from JB2. It's still there in JIT Builder, obviously, and, and I'm not saying <laughs> that, that LLJB isn't interesting from a JB2 perspective, but it's not needed for the JB2 implementation right now. So that's I was trying to strip out anything I didn't need. I created a, a new directory, like a new sort of top level directory, I guess, underneath JB2, which I just called API. Um, and I totally opened to a better name. I, I couldn't come up with a good name for it. Um, so I just called it API. And then I put all of the JB2 implementation underneath this API directory. And so, um, and then from, from a CMake, um, integration standpoint, I added a new OMR underscore JB2 flag, which dictates whether JB2 gets built or not. It does require that you build the OMR compiler still because it's uh, it requires the OMR compiler in order to generate native code. You don't have to build JIT Builder 1 because it's a complete copy of JIT Builder 1. And then uh, when you build JIT Builder 2, it automatically now builds the base, the complex, uh, say base extension, the VM extension, and the complex extension. Um, you know, we should probably add their own directories at some point, but it currently doesn't. Um, and then each of those extension directories adds their own tests into the, autom the automatic tests that run when you do make test um, from, your, from your CMake build directory. So there's currently a set of, I think, five additional tests that it runs at the, at the beginning of an OMR test run. That, that test the base extension, the VM extension, the complex extension. Uh, well, complex isn't actually fully working yet, so <laughs> it doesn't actually run those tests. Um, and uh, but it also runs uh, some bare some of the some of the 
functionality of the the JIT Builder core, which is kind of like the the um, the files that, that define what a compiler is and what an extension is, and and the sort of IL directory, uh, sorry, the IL implementation code. Um, I refer to that as the JIT Builder core, and and that there's a few a, a few small tests against some of that code as well. Um, so uh, there are a couple of side notes here that uh, I thought might be of, of interest. Uh, so I have not been using the Omar compiler code format for JB2, just as a, um, I, wanted, I wanted to have a more personal experience with using the, uh, the sort of different code formats that we had discussed in the context of the other, um, the other um, uh, efforts. <laughs> Where we where we talked about changing the code format, so it uses sort of the target code format that we talked about, uh, more or less. It's not exact, um, and I don't enforce it. I just kind of um, manually implement it it's four spaces, and it doesn't use the curly brace formatting that that the Omar compiler uses, uh, etc. So it and and you know I, I I just wanted to see what the code would look like, and I would say largely the code is. At least as readable as the Omar compiler code, maybe better in certain ways, and it's certainly no, certainly no harder to read than the Omar compiler code is. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, even even more in favor of a code format change at this point than I was previously. Um, uh, and the other point here is that uh, it's really a Linux platform kind of um, thing right now, so it uh, it assumes libdl. Um, is there so that's how it does the extension loading. Um, so it it, uh, it it is it is a little bit platform specific. It's not leveraging any of the any of the um, the, the port the the, uh, the Omar port library at all. So it's not quite cross platform yet, but it's a little bit better than just working on like say a Mac or something like that. <laughs> Anyway, so so this, I mean, this is one of the discussion points that I wanted to start at least on this call and get people's opinions on. Um, you know, this is a fairly substantial amount of code at this point. Like, it's probably I haven't measured it recently, but I would guess that it's more than twenty thousand lines of code at this point. With when if you add in all the tests and all of the other stuff that's there, um, and uh, and the documentation that I've been writing, which man, don't get too excited. It's not that. Uh, elaborate yet, but there are there is some documentation, um, uh, and uh, so I, I'm kind of wondering, you know, the more I go here, the more code I'm going to generate, and the bigger a code drop it's going to be in the end to bring this into Omar. Um, I would say it's it's kind of at a point where it's uh, quite useful. I think it'll be even better once I get the debugger going, um, which as I mentioned, I'm in the process of doing right now. Um, so I'm kind of thinking that this might be like now or very soon from now might be the right time to talk about integrating this into OMR. And that's one of the other reasons why I went down this path of trying to see what it would look like. Now, obviously there are pros and cons of, of doing that. Um, you know, once it's in OMR, it's kind of gonna be the project is gonna have to, and project committers are gonna have to Deal with pull requests from me for for changes that I make to to JIT Builder two, and obviously I'm the only expert in this right now because nobody else has been looking at it really. Um, but I mean that's um, that's maybe not a huge uh, burden for anyone, but uh, but it it does mean that the progress on enhancing JB two is going to become more exposed to the committer workload uh, for OMR. So I I, I don't. I know nobody's using it yet, and it's not going to be part of anyone's day job. So it's like I, I, on the one hand, I'd love to get this into the project so that more people could help me with it if they really wanted to. Not that I'm really expecting a lot of help there, but um, on the other hand, I know it's going to be effort and and um, it's going to be a burden to the committers to to deal with people changing it. <laughs> So I, I'll, I'll pause here. I've been talking for a long time uh, on a lot of different topics, but th this is the topic that I mostly wanted to discuss here. So if, if people have thoughts on this, um, I, I'm, my ears are open. I'd love to hear.
whether I've totally overwhelmed everybody or I turned off my microphone and nobody has heard anything I've said for the last 40 minutes, <laughs> 30 minutes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I know it's, I'm kind of hitting people point blank with it. So I guess I'll ask everyone to kind of start thinking about that a little bit, if you can, in whatever spare time you can afford here. And, and if you have opinions, feel free to reach out to me and we can discuss uh, at greater detail. Or maybe we can come back and discuss it at the the next Omar architecture meeting or something like that. Maybe that's the best way to do this. All right. Um, so I, I do have notions of where this is going from here. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, the type replacer and complex support isn't quite working right now. I, I kind of switched horses at one point and uh, started working on the debugger because I think the debugger is actually quite an interesting part of this. And, and I think I, I want to get it um, I've used the word modernized here, but it's really just because the debugger was written with uh, an earlier, um, uh, the earlier design of Jit Builder 2, and it's changed enough that the debugger doesn't work anymore. Uh, in fact, it won't, it doesn't build, and there's quite substantial changes needed to it. So I'm sort of 80% of the way through those changes, making those changes, and I just have to kind of get it back to working uh, again. So, because I, I, again, I think this is a, the debugger is kind of a very interesting piece of this. Uh, so I'm I'm trying to get it back to normal. Uh, right now, it's been I'm integrating it into the base extension, which isn't the best place for it, but it's kind of the I think the easiest place to integrate it to start with, and then then I can work on breaking it apart so that it can parts of it can move into the core, and then um, maybe it doesn't have to necessarily be attached to uh, functions, which are things that get introduced in the base extension support for functions, that is. Um, as I mentioned, contributing to Omar is a big question in my mind right now um, and, and, and uh, that I've asked for feedback for. And then the, the rest of the points here are really just different kinds of uh, things that I think need to get done. And, and I'm so I've sort of made some progress on some of these as I went, but, but there's, and some of them have completely not started yet. So um, I guess I could have ordered these to make that a little bit more obvious. But anyway, uh, the, the, I'll just go through them in order. So right now, JB2 generates native code by making JIT Builder 1 calls. Right? It, it, after you generate the JIT Builder 2 IL, once you request that it be compiled, it basically um, walks over the JIT Builder 2 IL and makes JIT Builder 1 calls to actually generate OMR compiler IL, which is then compiled. So it's kind of a... Um, uh, it's a more more redundancy than is needed here at JIT Builder. There, there's no reason why JIT Builder 2 could not be directly generated um, by the OMR compiler IL. In fact, it, you could take that a step further and say there's no reason nobody, uh, uh, sorry, there's no reason a person couldn't write <laughs> a native code generator directly in JIT Builder 2. But you know, I think that's not a direction that I've that I'm likely to pursue directly myself. Um, I think the the most that I would do here is to generate code directly from JB2 down to OMR compiler IL. And I think G, uh, you can do a better job doing that with the JIT builder IL because you can see all the IL at, the, at once and you can use information that you can glean from the JIT builder from the IL to generate better OMR compiler IL right from the get go and require fewer um, sort of cleanup passes than JIT builder one requires. As I mentioned, JIT Builder 1 is, a, is really a pass-through API, so it's it has to be a little bit conservative in how it generates IL so that it can uh, it can piece everything together. Um, and that just means you need more cleanup passes to be able to get rid of all the inefficiencies that are there to provide that generality that's, that's needed. Um, another thing would be to bring more of the JIT Builder 1 operations into base extension. So the best example here are the, the arithmetic operations. JIT Builder 1 has a, a wealth of uh, arithmetic operators inside it. JIT JB2 has uh, add, sub, and mull. <laughs> um, basically what you need for matrix multiply. So it, 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 it could really you know, benefit from having more operations brought into the base extension to make it a little bit more capable. Um, it actually has a fairly complete 
set of uh, memory operations like loading local variables and parameters, loading uh, from structs, fields of structs. Um, it even, in principle, <laughs> can load an entire struct as a value, um, but it wouldn't know how to convert it to Omar Compiler IL right now to be able to actually generate code for that. Nonetheless, um, uh, and it's also missing quite a few control flow kind of structures. Um, interestingly, things like type replacer and debugger are going to drive more work here uh, to support things like uh, uh, the debugger actually relies on switch, for example. So I'm going to have to bring switch into into the base extension and you know things like that. Uh, a big area of uh, you know where I've been trying to do better with JB2 than than we've done historically with the Omar compiler or with JBuilder One for that matter is to be able just to write more unit tests. So uh, base extension has a fairly, uh, I won't say complete, because it, it, there are certain operations and types that are very well tested uh, in the base extension. There are others that are not well tested. <laughs> but uh, when you, when you uh, compile the base extension and it adds tests into the, into the, um, uh, uh, into the, into the CMake uh, test, it, it basically runs, I can't remember the exact number, I computed it once, but it's something on the order of 2,000 uh, tests, and each one of those is an individual compilation that gets, you know, it compiles something and runs a test on it and runs multiple tests on it and gets results and verifies that they're all correct and that some of them are positive tests, some of them are negative tests, etc. So it's, it's, a, it's better than it um, has been, but it's still not as good as it could be. And what I'd really like to do here is is, uh, is spend some time building a real unit test framework here that's that would you know where the tests for operations are sort of implemented very close to where the operations themselves are implemented, um, and and so you could maintain them and fairly represent it at a fairly high level, so you wouldn't need to you know write very much infrastructure in order to add new unit tests for for different operations. Right now, it's pretty ad hoc, and it relies a lot on macros, and it gets pretty confusing to see what the like. It 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 does a lot of unit tests, but it's not a very pretty implementation. I wouldn't say I'm not all that proud of it, <laughs> other than the fact that it's there. <laughs> um, writing more documentation is obviously uh, an important thing for this. Um, I've started, but it's at a quite high level right now. It's kind of like when I get when I. When I don't feel like writing code, but I feel like doing something, I'll try to write down a few lines of documentation in various places. So it's kind of being added to on a, on a, on a slow, uh, not always steady <laughs> pace. Um, but I am trying to fill in some of the sort of, you know, what is what are the con concepts here? What are, how do they relate? How do they fit together? You know, where are things supposed to go? What's the um, what are the things I need to do in order to add a new operation? What are the things I need to do in order to add a new type? What are the things I need to do in order to create a new extension? That sort of stuff. Which I wish I had more detailed documentation for at the moment, but it's aspirational. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the things that bugs me the most about JB2 is that it's really just infrastructure right now. It's not very useful for doing very much other than generating code. Um, I would like to make it a more analyzable kind of thing or do, you know, start being able to write an analyses on it. Um, I don't think it would be very hard to write a data flow engine that operates on it, especially now that the operation, a pointer to an operation is a program point. Uh, but I just haven't done it and there, there's, as you, there's so many other things that need to be done that I'm, I'm trying to get done be, before I get myself excited about writing a data flow engine which is at least one of the fundamental pieces that you need in a compiler analysis framework. Um, but it's currently not there. Uh, and then finally, with all the great work that's being done with, uh, you know, that's being driven by OpenJ9s uh, and, the, and the Java Vector API work that's been going on, you know, Omar has much better support for vector instruction generation than it's ever had in the past. Um, and it's, it's an area that I've dabbled in a little bit uh, with with uh, JIT Builder one, but I think you know it, right now we're at a point where we could really start writing a vector extension that could do some very cool things with the Omar um, uh, infrastructure, and 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 I'd love to do some of that, but I just don't have I haven't had the time to, to start it. 
but I think a lot of the, the base infrastructure is now there. And so, you know, adding a vector extension would be really JB2 work more than, than maybe some JB2, JB1 work to, to or, or OMAR compiler work to generate the code, right? Um, and I think that's basically it. Uh, I don't think I have anything else. Yeah, questions. So, does anyone have any questions? Stunned silence. All right, let, let me ask a question then. <laughs> it, is, the, it, is it a problem that I didn't give a refresher on what JB2 looks like? Is that part, is that, like, I, I know I'm, I'm very close to this, so it's very easy for me to, to associate what all the words meant in the presentation to the things that I've been doing. So should, should I have included a refresher on JB2 before I went into all of this detail? You're all talking on mute. <clears throat> I think a refresher of some sort would have helped. Yeah. I... Yeah. Okay. All right. So in in future versions of this, then I'll I'll uh, I'll make sure to include a quick refresher on on what JB two looks like, just to help refresh people's minds. All right. Well, uh, in case it doesn't sound like I'm going to get very many questions here. <laughs> Um, as you all know, I'm always available on, uh, on Slack in various places, by either at the OMR project or, or uh, if you work at IBM inside the IBM Slack. So if anybody has any more questions or questions occur to you uh, that you want to ask, feel free to reach out and I'm always happy to, to talk about it. And um, maybe, maybe what I'll do is I'll give, come back in another um, little while and give a, a more refresher on what JB2 looks like and then a shorter version of this update that that revisits some of the questions and we'll see how that goes all right with that i'm going to close the call so thanks everyone for joining and uh, i hope you enjoy the rest of your day we'll talk to you at the next meeting thanks mark yeah. bye